the camera doesn't bite because last Sunday I only saw one person sitting over there and everybody sitting over here. So I was just starting to wonder if you got scared of the camera again or other kids. Being. And Natalie, if you started it? Oh, it's going. Okay, I didn't know if it was, so I appreciate that. Let's just stand up to the Lord this evening. Any requests as we would go to the Lord this evening as well? I realize there was prayers this morning, but we can still keep the, them in mind and unspoken. Okay. Heavenly Father, as we come before thee this evening, Lord, we sense that spirit of praise here this evening, Lord. We appreciate, Lord, thy presence. And Lord, I just pray that, Lord, that you have part in every, that, Lord, in every part of this service. Bless my brothers and sisters, Lord, this evening I pray. Lord, meet those prayer requests that has gone before thee. And Lord, we remember Israel, thy nation, Lord, at this time. You have your eye on them as well as you have your eye on the bride. Now we commit the service in your hands in that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Can we see it this evening? is on my heart so move on me holy spirit
endless with so many things. God's been so good to me. Anybody have a number up on their hearts? I once seen it for across the bridge. There's no more sorrow
17 in the red book. Maybe we could try one, four, three in the blue book. Evening time. The God of this evil age has blinded the minds today. Accepting the word of God for 
Lord, this is the evening time. This is the evening time. It's later than you think. The bride is preparing now for her Lord and me. Oh, It has an Darkness throughout the land. The world just can't understand. The prophet has walked this land, proclaiming the way to God. Save today, then follow the words we gave. Accept in the word of God, for this is the evening time. This is the evening time. It's later than you think. The bride is. It has an ear to hear the evening time is here. And this is the evening time. The third watch. He will come the trouble waters up your soul Take your broken heart and make it whole When the storms of this life around you roll He will come the trouble waters the dark trouble waters dark trouble waters of your soul. If your heart is burdened, you have a friend who knows your struggle. have gone. He will calm the troubled waters of your soul. He'll take your broken heart and make it whole. When the storms of this life Dark, 
song tonight? Joyce, do you have one afterwards? We have time for a testimony. That's good. I want to thank the Lord for all that he's done for me. Um, we put our house up for sale uh, probably three weeks ago or something like that, and uh, I don't know what I was expecting. Probably wouldn't sell or whatever, but uh, we had a lot of interest, and we actually sold the house. So uh, the last few days, we're just looking at each other, and we're just wondering where we're going to go. And uh, it's one of those things, and uh, I just said, well, you know, the Lord knows where we're going to go, because we sure don't know where we're going quite yet, so I'm uh, thankful that we can put our trust in Him, and He'll guide, uh, he'll guide our footsteps, and I just put all my faith in Him that He'll find the right place for us, and I'm thankful for all that He does for us. as usual. <laughs>
there's none for you are awesome in our lives doing wonders oh lord who is like you
Brother Elijah, do you have a song tonight? Can you dream? Can you imagine? 
imagine or oh, what it'll be right or oh, to see him and when our feet lift off the ground and we'll know we're heaven bound oh won't it be wonderful won't it be wonderful to see the king happy it's good um, I believe at this time we'll turn the service order to brother Fred speaking of brother Fred it's his birthday today maybe we could sing happy birthday not tomorrow but we're gonna celebrate tonight <laughs> happy birthday to Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear friend. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. On you. God's blessings on you. God's blessings on you. God's blessings on you. We should have had some balloons and stuff. <laughs> arriba, arriba. <laughs> Happy birthday, Fred. <laughs> Got to tone it down a little bit.
system. It's us sometimes that we get a little weary. And Lord knows that's part of our trial, really, as we walk with him. And if we be faithful, he'll sh in his time, like that song Sister Sings, in your time. Well, no, that's not the one you sing, but there's another one you sing. I had it just while she was testifying. I was, I was almost going to start singing that, but I don't sing along, so praise the Lord. God's good. There are mountaintops and there are valleys. But the biggest mountaintop is yet to come when we receive our resurrected bodies. I'm thankful that the Lord is, has not left us without food. But then again, we must walk with him. And we must not ne neglect the walk that we have with the Lord in the hour that we live in. This morning we are reviewing some of the things that God has done over the years for you and I. And I'm thankful that he has a way to light our pathway, that the light gets brighter and clearer as we go down life's road. But here we are at the end time. When we look at Israel, that's the last generation. And it's looking ever so evidently that he's counted that generation in 1967. And being 70, that's gone five generations from 20 years old, uh, 20 years old and up. I'm not saying there's another 20 years but if that be the scripture that that generation will see all things fulfilled, how long and how far? And God can do wonders in a few moments of time for us that sometimes we think things are going to be a, it will take God a, another 10 years to do things. He can do things pretty quick. He he can speed things up in the life of a person, or he can slow things down to teach us patience. But I'm thankful that the Lord is a good teacher. The in now, I wanted to continue on from this morning, but we're I was looking at and concerning the day of the Lord when we come with the Lord Jesus Christ and how wonderful that'll be. I'm glad that we won't be doing the actual executing of the sinners, but with our eyes, we'll see it. We're gonna walk on the ashes of the sinners. That's when we come down and stand. And when that happens, there's not gonna be ashes all over the whole globe. It'll be in areas where volcanoes are at to fulfill that scripture. Otherwise, we'd need a lot of brooms and shovel to clean the way, right? And so, but it will be part of God's word to being fulfilled. Now, when we come with the Lord Jesus Christ, There's a host of angels that are coming with us. And from the scripture, we know that the army is plural in Revelation chapter 19. That the word says it's army plural. And so therefore, the angelic host is quite a number. They're in the 50 to 100 million. That's a lot. But when you and I come with the Lord and we're dealing with the destruction of the earth in the day of the Lord. What are these angels doing? 
Have you ever thought about it? Are they just flying around the earth overlooking things? No. Because remember, there's a scripture that talks about that at the wedding supper, or actually in the middle of the week of Daniel, that Satan is thrust out to the earth. That's in the week of Daniel. And all the unholy angels are thrown to the, towards the earth. So when the Lord does come with the angelic beings, they will be dealing with those fallen angels. And the only scripture that there is that shows, and that's in Revelation chapter 19, if you, uh, 20, if you want to go there this, this evening. I'm so used to preaching in the morning, I think it's still morning. Now it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, with a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. That just talks about Satan, doesn't it? But actually when we read that scripture, it's a representation of all the fallen angels. That's why in the day of the Lord, the army that are the angelic beings, they're going to be fighting against those fallen angels that has been on the earth, and they're going to be bound for a thousand years. In that millennium, there is no fallen angels that's going to tempt those mortal subjects. Won't that be wonderful? Well, it'd be nice if we had that today, right? Does Satan bother you from time to time? Does he whisper in your ear? but you don't have to listen to them. We have God's word to hold on to. Now, as I was looking at this morning, I don't know if it's, they are still here, but I'll just try it. Yeah, there it is. That's in 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1. The other week I mentioned it was 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 4, but actually 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Anyway, by quoting the scripture, I think we have enough knowledge and understanding where that scripture is. It says here, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing, which is one part, which we dealt with this morning, that his appearing has nothing to do when he comes in his physical second coming. Because then we're coming with him. We're not going to be judged then. We've already judged. We've been at the wedding supper. So that appearing has to be when the Lord comes and we meet him in the air according to Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And meeting him in the air... If there's seven or ten million of us, how close are you going to get to Jesus and say hello? So meeting in the air means you, we meet him in the spirit world. And so therefore, this scripture, whole, small as it is, there is other scripture that talks about the quick and the dead concerning the bride of Jesus Christ. The quick and the dead... You and I are the quick. How many of you know what the word quick is referred to in the Bible? You have been quickened by the Spirit. You've been born again. But the fact that you're living on the earth, the Scripture describes you and I as being quickened. But then when we pass on from this life and go to be in glory with the Lord, we're called the dead in Christ. And so therefore, in that Scripture... I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. At, 
if I can put it this, this way, that's part A. And then it talks about at his kingdom. And we know when the Lord does come, when that seventh seal is broke, it's the only time that we can put the judgment seat of Christ. You cannot put the judgment seat of Christ prior to the half hour silence because the last seed has not probably come in. So nowhere does that judgment seat take place before the seventh seal is broke. First of all, when Jesus is on that mercy seat, it's a seat of mercy. And that seat of mercy is there till he opens the seventh seal. Then now that seat becomes vacant. Did Jesus just disappear? No. It's shown a transition from being a high priest, and now he's moved into another role, which is now that seat is actually becoming, if you want to, not that he sits in that same seat, and it's not that it's a physical chair that you go sit down on. But he's moving from the position of being high priest. Now he moves into the role of being the judge for the judgment seat of Christ, for the judgment seat. That's, I believe, is clear enough. To, it's so simple to understand. I'm glad the Lord doesn't make it complicated. Now, when I say it's simple to understand, because you have a lot of truth that God has raised you on that you can see this picture readily. So now as he's judging the mortal bride that has gone in that half hour silence, that'll be you and I, that are, if we be alive at that time, we're going to come before his judgment seat. And no, you won't have to worry, because if you are there, you are saved. He doesn't bring an unsaved person before his judgment seat. It's for the bride and the bride only. But now as we are being judged, that's the quick and the dead. So that now it fulfills the scripture as we would look at it here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. That's the quick and the dead at his appearing. Now, when we look at this picture, when I mentioned that at his appearing, he appears when that half hour silent is closing. But the judgment, everything has to be done and prepared and everybody being judged and it being final because when he appears, he's coming to take his bride away. We're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And we're going to rise from wherever we are on the globe. We rise from there in the spirit realm. How long will it take? Well, okay, maybe I'll, I don't want to go that far there for tonight. Just to keep it in, li in line what we're looking at. So now that's at his coming that he's going to be judging the quick, which is down here on the earth, and the dead in glory. And remember, the dead in glory, it's on individual basis that has to come before him. And if there be, if there be uh, seven million uh, bride saints, you don't do that in six months. That's why when we say the half hour silence, we look at the boundaries of it. We know where the boundaries lie. We are looking at what's in it. By looking what's in it gives us an approximate time of how much time it would take. Because I don't think in the spirit world things speed up so quick that he can judge seven million individually in six months. Now, that judgment seat is like, really, it's an interview. You've been saved. You've been called for the interview. Now, in the interview, the, the, the boss tells you, you're going to have this position, right? All right. Now, I want to go back to the, the next part. And his appear as his kingdom. Now, his kingdom... It's not here. Jesus has received a kingdom to be, to rule and reign in. And he will rule and reign when he comes in his physical second coming. 
All right. So when he does come in his physical second coming, and not that we real, I thank God for what God has shown the apostle that God had on the earth. But I could see from what he's saying in the last 10 years of his life, he says that millennium, when it starts, it starts with the judgment. And it's not everybody brought to Jerusalem to be judged. Because remember, the key to, re to looking at this picture here tonight, it's a parable. A parable implies a thought. It's just like when you, you if you read the, the beginning of Matthew chapter 25, five wise and five foolish, is that all they're going to be in the last, in the last 100 years, just five, five of each? We know that's not true. Or the foolish saying, give us of your oil. We don't have a, we don't carry a, you carry a flask of oil with you in case a foolish virgin come and ask you. It's portraying what's transpiring. God's using words in a parable form to show what's transpiring. But it seems like when we get to Matthew 25, verse 31 and 32, which is when he comes and sits on his throne and he divides the sheep from the goat, our mind goes in a literal mode and says, oh, he's bringing all the sheep right before him. Well, first of all, the holies of holies is only 20 cubits or 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet. You ain't going to put more than maybe 50 people in there if you can crowd them in. And if the overcomer is granted to sit in his throne where he sits in Jerusalem, if you take that literally, there's no way you're going to fit in that temple. Nor even in the, the inner courtyard. It might hold 10,000 there. It won't even hold all, the whole bride. So it's not talking in those terms. So the millennium does start when he sits in that temple. Now, I don't want to go in the 45 days how it's being restored and the temple being prepared and his foot touched the mud of olive and the earth starts to stop the shaking and the reeling. Every, now, some of you may be not as old as I am, since I am 70 now. Ever played with one of those toss when you were young? That you, would, you crank those things? And that thing would just spin right nice if you just crank it right. But uh, sometimes you'd play and you want to see what would happen. You'd give it a little touch. And all of a sudden that thing just goes a, a whipping around. It's causing all kinds of contortion. But then when it, after a while, it sort of comes down. It doesn't come down immediately. Well, that's how the earth is going to do. So when the 30 days are over, yes, the sinners are destroyed. But now that has to take a certain time to come to settle down. I'll put it in another form. Even today, throughout man's history, when an earthquake takes place, you get aftershocks, even up to a month later. All right? So even if it did stop on, God says, whoop, I'll stop it 30, after 30 days, there's still going to be aftershocks. But the fact that Zechariah 14.4, when that Mount of Olives splits, it to me is a signal. That's the last earthquake. He's getting re ready now to go into the temple and start that millennium rule. Now, in, when he's in that millennium rule, we know that he's going to divide the sheep from the goats. And dividing the sheep from the goat, when you look at verse 31 and 32, if you're looking at it, just him sitting on a throne and seeing a whole bunch of sheep and goats, then you're missing the picture. When he sits on that throne, what does it really represent? He's setting up his government. And the government has representative, which is the bride. We're going to rule and judge the world. Jesus is not going to be 
saying, now wait a minute, bride, step aside. I have to separate every sheep and every goat. That's not how you portray the picture. As we come in our places, when his foot touches the Mount of Olives, he's in Jerusalem. You and I, as the world turns, which, is, which we can be anywhere in the world within 24 hours, from the spirit world, as we drop down, we'll drop down to our countries, and we'll drop down, and then we'll bring the sheep and the goats that are alive in our country and where we come from. Uh, there's another picture maybe I could kind of portray. Here. Since when the rapture takes place, two shall be sleeping, two will be working in the field. In other words, they're at opposite end of the globe. One's in the sun, one's at night. When we rise, the people down here don't come through the earth to come up this way. They rise in the spirit world where they're at, right? So when we come with the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, he's going to have that army to come together. Now, ever picture how big that army's going to be that is in the sky when it comes? If we're in about, about in the order of seven million bride saints coming down, but it says all the angels are coming too. They're in the order of 100... 50 or 100 million, much more than the bride is. So that's going to be quite a display coming down. But as we come down, as Jesus, he hits towards Jerusalem, you and I are in the spirit world, but not affected by gravity. And as the world turns, within 24 hours, you will drop in your throne position where we came from. Actually, where we went up, probably is the same place where we're going to come down. But I want to be in a better place. I don't want to be in New Brunswick. I want to be, uh, I don't know. Let me see, Lord, if I get a map. Oh, I want to try Mexico this time. Now we come in the area that, or likely where we're, we're from. I know that's ab-living a bit, but. Because the reason it'll take 24 hours, the Earth is 24,000 miles in, in circumference, not diameter, that's a mistake there. And the rotations, that, and in 24 hours, the Earth makes one revolution, so it's at 1,000 miles an hour. So within a day, you and I can be in our throne position. So as Jesus now sits in his throne, and when he sits in his throne, remember, he wants, he's asking for the 12 Disciples says he's in the regeneration. You're going to sit and judge too. And when it talks about that the saints are going to judge the world, that's not after the, the sheep and the goats are divided. It's part of that judgment. We're going to be involved in the, the sheep and the goats because we're going to be part of that government. Does Trudeau go to every court to say, okay, I don't want a judge to represent me. I'm going to be there for every, every case. No. Or does a king in the old days, did he go to every place and do such? No. He represented the nation. And so is it with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's there to represent the nation. Now remember, it would be pretty tight to try to get in that cubicle area. Now remember, if he's sitting on his throne judging them, now if you want to make it literal, he's sitting on his throne, he's going to judge all the sheep and the goats. How many sheep can you get in that inner court? Not very many. It'll take, that'll take a whole while. And when we're talking about few, there's seven and a half billion people on the planet. If 1%, would you say 1% would almost qualify as being a few? Well, 1% of 7.5 billion, if it's not on? Huh? Oh, the battery's going. Okay. Okay, put it on hold for now.
Is that better? Okay. So the judgment seat of Christ, or sorry, when the uh, when He sits on His throne, at the same time we sit on our throne, judging the sheep. It'll all be done at the same time. When it talks about where that the scripture talks about the saints are going to judge the world, it begins right from day one when we sit on the throne and part of it is judging the sheep and the goat. Well, I don't want to send no goats to, to be banished away. Well, what are you going to do during the millennium if one misbehaves? The subject's gone in there and the rod of correction has to be administered and he sent and died. So there is no difference. All right. But I'm getting away from what I'm trying to look at here this, this evening. And I had mentioned earlier, with, got away from the thought too as well. In the last 10 years, Brother Jackson always put, when Jesus sits on his throne, that's when the millennium starts. That, the, ju the judging of the sheep and goats is the part of starting that millennium. And because we'll take a little pet scripture and say, well, enter into the joy of the Lord or enter into the, the, uh, the kingdom that's been, in, been for you. Well, inherit means they're standing there. It's not because inherit, that, that's when the millennium starts. Because to show when the millennium starts, one key scripture you have to get around that points that it has to be right there after the day of the Lord is over. And that you will find. Right here. Blessed is he that comes to the 1,335 days and that brings you to day one of the opening of the millennium. You can't twist that or turn that and say, well, the person is blessed before the 45 days. He's blessed because the millennium starts in 1,335 days from the middle of the week. If you read verse 11 and verse 12, it tells you from the middle of the week, that's when you measure that time. So now knowing those things, we are now at the beginning of the opening of the millennium and now I want to get to the part that we're looking at here this evening. So we're at the opening of the millennium. And Paul, uh, the apostle Paul saying, I charge thee. Now he didn't say, well, it would be nice. He's really making it, he's stressing the point. He says, I charge thee before God. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing, that's when he comes for you and I, for the bride, and his kingdom, that's when the kingdom is being set up. Now, you're here, the millennium is in the process of starting, he's dividing the sheep, in the process of dividing the sheep and the goats. According to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he's going to judge the quick and the dead. That has nothing to do with your sheep and goats. Okay? It has nothing to do with the mortal people that's come through the, the week of Daniel and the day of the Lord. The sheep and the goats are just going to be divided. But according to the Apostle Paul, at his kingdom, when that starts, he's going to judge the quick and the dead. Can you tell me who's the quick? When you come here on day one, or at the beginning of that millennium. You don't know? Weren't listening last week or the week before? No, no, I shouldn't do that, it's not nice. Um, the quick means somebody that has been sealed with the Spirit that is alive. Now remember, they're coming before him for their reward. 
What do you think about the 144,000? Has they been resurrected? No. Not like some preacher saying they're going to be raptured. Did you know that? There's a preacher in the, that has mentioned that the 144,000 are going to be raptured. I don't know where he pulls it, puts the woman or, or if he does it or doesn't, but that's immaterial. The scripture declares that they will not be killed. If they're not going to be killed, they're not going to be raptured because you have to die to go up in heaven. So therefore, the quick at that opening of that millennium is none other but your 144,000 and the woman Israel, right? You understand that part? They're, the, they're, they're mortal. They have the, they've been sealed with the Holy Ghost. They're the only ones that are sealed with the Holy Ghost coming through that week of Daniel to begin with and the day of the Lord. So that's your quick. Now, what about the other part? Because remember, that has two parts in it too when he's doing that at the opening of that millennium right here. The dead is none other but your white robes. And how is he going to judge those white robes? Do we have scripture to look at how he's going to judge them? Because they're going to come before him, but they're going to come in, or in, in their order because the last shall be first and the, and the first shall be last. Those that came through the great tribulation period of time are raised as a witness against the, the sheep and the, for the sheep and the goats. So therefore, all these white robes that have come down from heaven, as Jesus has come down now to sit on His throne, they're not left up in glory. They come, everybody in heaven has now moved to the earthly position. And as these white robes are there, he's not going to do them individually because their reward is simple. They're going to be priests in the millennium. Everybody will have the same reward. Well, where'd you get that, Brother Fred? Well, if we go tonight into Matthew chapter 20, He says, the kingdom of heaven is like to a man that went, that is a householder, and went early in the morning to hire the labor in his vineyards. And when he had agreed, and when he had agreed with the laborers a penny for a day, he sent them into the vineyard. So here in the early age, in the grace age, he's talking about white robes now. He says, do you agree to work for a penny and your reward will be one penny? He's not talking about their salvation. He's talking about the rewards. Because the Holy Ghost is not a penny. The, Holy Ghost, the penny is a reward, right? Somebody gives you a dime or a dollar or ten dollars or a hundred dollars. It's like a reward. Or All right. Then there's some that came later in the day. Even up to the ninth hour, the eleventh hour, and even at the end, just prior to, to coming through the end, even those, he says, you agree to work for a penny. Now, when he's saying to these group work for a penny, we, yes, we see the parable as it being a day, but he's talking about the grace age day, if you want to. So the ones in the first church age, never saw those in the last church age. So they won't, there's no communication from, from what the agreement would be as a penny. But then when the grace age is over, okay, and then we find that in verse 8. And so when it was, even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said to the steward, Call the laborers. Call them all. Why is he going to call them all? Not in a half hour silence. Not in the time for coming for the bride. 
He's going to be calling them all when he comes and sits on his throne. Call the laborers and give them their hiring and beginning from the last one of the first. Now they're all there as a bunch. And when they, they came that were hired in about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. And they were rejoicing because they came at the end. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured. They didn't murmur to the point of sinning. But they were unhappy with their reward. Now remember, these white robes have salvation. But we're talking about the reward part, not the salvational part. And saying to these last that have wrath but one hour, thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the heat, the burden of the heat of the day, and said, friend, I do thee no wrong. Did I not agree with, did you not, did, sorry, didst not thou agree with me for a penny? In other words, did you agree for a penny's reward for the work? He says, take that which is thine and go thy way, and I will give unto the last, even unto thee. So everybody gets the same penny, gets the same reward. So although that the White robes are a large multitude coming out of the grace age. He's not going to be taking three, four years to do all, if there be 10 million of the, the white robe people. That would take a long time for each one to get, hey, you, you come up, you're next, you're a penny, not next one, you're a penny. It's just a parable showing all of you that came through the grace age. You could have been bride, but you felt short of being a bride, so therefore you have been accorded eternal life as white robes. And so according to the word that's been written, that everyone that has white robes is going to be priests in that kingdom. So that'll take very short order. So when it comes now, he's, he's dividing the sheep and the goats, he'll bring up those and it's not, and those white robes are not all in Jerusalem. They are worldwide. They'll be where your throne is at when this is unfolding all at the same time. Now, re remember, this is a government in function, in work. Jesus sits at the top. He has the 12 apostles there. And the 12 apostles are not the only ones who are going to be judging the 12 tribe of Israel. How many know there was 5,000 and 8,000 Jewish bride? in the first year of the, when the grace age opened. So they'll be judging, since they're bride, they'll be judging as well. So that'll cover that nation pretty good, wouldn't it? All right. So now, as he's dividing, getting ready to divide the sheep and the goats, he brings forth the white robes that is associated in the week of Daniel that has been there as a witness to what the sheep did and what the goats have done. I don't want to read all of Matthew 25, the parable from 33 down to 47 or so. But basically what it's, it's saying that he's going to bring them in their time frame. He's not going to bring them all at once because according to what the angel told Daniel in the 12th chapter, Daniel, wait in your order you will be there, okay, for, for their time. Is this, so the, getting back to the scripture now, so therefore at the beginning of the millennium, yes, Second Timothy chapter 4, 1, and I call it the B part, is at his kingdom, there is a judgment for the quick, which is your 144,000 and the woman, and the dead is your white-robed saints that are getting their rewards. Now, one day, a woman asked Jesus, I want, can, I, can you get 
my two sons to sit on your left side and right hand side? And Jesus says, it's not for me to give, it's the Heavenly Father. And we don't know who that is, or at least not that we know in this time, who will be sitting on this right hand side and on the left hand side. That, that's pretty well in, in, in that room where he's at. And who they'll be, it's the Father that's going to determine who's going to be sitting right next to Jesus. It's not even the 12 apostles. Because he told them, it's not for you to know. It's the Father who does that choice. He says, it's not mine. So, there's... There's been raising up again, and it's been dealt with in the past. This was a chart that was brought in 2000, after 2005, probably around six or seven, I don't know the exact year. And this is talking about the penalty being over. And the ministry had dealt with it that it was an error. First of all, the era of the miraculous did not start in 2004. If it is, I wish to be in it, if it was, somewhere. And then when it's being projected, like, well, it's moving into it, just like what I heard of the Jehovah Witness way back saying, well, we're, the Millennium Kingdom has started, it's just progressing into it. That's way back in the 1900s. I mean, where have they got hit their heads? Sunk in the sand somewhere. And so lately, it's been revised to picture this. They're playing around with dates, and they're trying to show the two days of Hosea has to do with the time from around 33 AD to about the time of 2004. First of all, I'd have to say, if they're listening, well, that's not the one I wanted, but it's should be one should be close by. It doesn't matter, it'll do the same, I guess. Might have it in the day of the Lord. Yeah, here. When the angel came to see Gabriel concerning the 70 prophetic weeks concerning their people, that nation, and says there would be 70 weeks determined, that's a time clock for you Jews. You can measure it with God's clock and time from when it started till the 69th week. But when the 69th week came, the clock stopped. What part that these don't understand that the clock is stopped? God is not marking no more time for Jews, period, till the 70th week starts. That's how you read Daniel. The clock has stopped. God has cut off time dealing with the Jews till he picks them up in the 70th week. So the clock stopped in 69. He'll start it up again over here. So the two days of Hosea, if God said there's only 70 weeks, 
I stopped the time clock for dealing with the Jews in the 69th week. Although it is an Old Testament prophet, Hosea, those two days has nothing to do with time counting for the Jews. Because otherwise, then the clock didn't start. He said, well, it stopped temporarily until Hosea comes in and fits something in there. That is an error. When the clock is stopped, those two days of Hosea is Gentile time. And when the Gentile time starts, it will run till the week of Daniel begins. They coincide, stopping at the same time. You don't have to use any calculation and they try to use dates and whatnot. Do you know what date, year, today is in the Jewish calendar? No, you don't. I realize that. Sorry, I shouldn't ask that question. But just, I'm just using that to catch your attention. It's year 5,777. So if you're using 1,000 days a, as a day exactly with the Lord, first of all, you're going to fall in a lot of problems. The flood did not happen in the first 1,000 years. While some, they'll rig this up, and then it means this, and mean that, and the other thing. I'm sorry, but we're living now in the Jewish year from the days of creation. There's the Jewish are saying it's in the year 5777. That's in 217 right now. And in 217, according to our uh, Gregorian calendar, we're in 60017. Well, they, the Jews start their, the beginning of man, when they look back in the B.C. period, is 3,761. As when you go back from the time of Christ, going back from the Jewish point of view, that's when, it's, that's when Adam was placed on the earth. Well, if you go back from there, and to us, it's, man puts it as being 4,000 or 4,001. I'm uh, sure different ones have put in certain dates. So he put in 2,000 years for the Gentile, which 2,000 of our time now brings that. We're at 2,017, right? So 2,000 plus 4, that's 6,017. So if you're playing around with dates, there's nowhere in the scripture you're going to get those dates to match up. But how simple it is, if we look at the scriptures, right, that Hosea was really talking about the time of the Gentiles. It says, after two days, after the Gentile is over, that's when he deals, spiritually speaking, with the Jews. So right now, the Jews are only going to be talking about, spirit, they're going to be spiritually spoken to, when the week of Daniel begins. That's what Brother Brown taught. That's what Brother Jackson taught. Not putting an emphasis on that, but from the scripture point of view. Then, when it comes to the point where the Gentile closes and the Jews are over here, sometimes Satan gets to the place, well, they're being revived now in the land. I don't know, I don't know much about English, but I know the difference between restore, restoration and being renewed, revived. So God is restoring Israel to her place till she's all in the land and in her full complement that that's when he will revive them. Right now we're living in the restoration, which has nothing to do with revival. If, there, if God was reviving the Jews, yes, they're getting happy that they have the land and so forth, but you mentioned that Jesus is the Messiah, and the Jews will let you know real quick, no, he's not. It's Jehovah, and he's going to send a Messiah somewhere. They never accepted Jesus Christ. So therefore... Yes, from 1948, as God brought them into the land and they got more land and they're going to get more land until they get their full land, to me that is restoration, not them being made alive or in that manner. Anyway, I just want to finish that with, with that tonight. I thought, let you know, well, most of you understand that the 2004, yes, it's said that Brother Jackson passed away. 
And yes, he had every right to say from 33, from what he was looking at in those days, that it would probably end in 2004 and a half. And what gets me sometimes, they have enough grace to see that Brother Jackson's revelation grew and material, uh, matured more and more as time went on. But don't let no one go from there on into the third watch. Because what we knew in 2005, God has opened up the picture a little bit more clearly. And if you want to go back to 2005, yeah, you can hang some things. Because God has opened up the revelation much more clear today than we had in 2005. But what's holding true when their true revelation comes on ground, it still holds true in this hour. Sevenfold light. Is it still true today? Sure it is. We have seven, the bride at the end will have sevenfold more light than the early church had. Not more of the Holy Ghost, but more knowledge of the revelation of God. And in order to know more of the revelation of God, that's why in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, it talks about that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy, and it's through that spirit of prophecy that the bride here at the end time will come in to that sevenfold light. We have not reached the climax of that sevenfold light, but we're getting near to a good portion of it now. I don't... <laughs> This is all, cheer up, brothers and sisters, because what you see now seems like things are in disarray. But when Israel gets her land and her temple, the bride will have her word and the gifts. And whatever needs to be done to put things in order, that's when it's going to transpire. And for that short space of time, during, yes, while Israel has a miracle war, the bride will be moving in a miraculous manner and will have but a short time till we hit Ezekiel 38 and 39. And between the miracle war and Ezekiel 38 and 39, if there be three years, be about it. Jesus' ministry was three years. Now, I'm not saying it has to be three years. Now, somebody will say, oh, he's putting dates again. But you have to put in a certain, let's put it, it's not in two seconds, right? First of all, when the miracle war happens, they have to clean some of the rubbish out of the way. They got to take down the walls they put up. And their dromedarian down from, way down from uh, Dedan has to bring up those sheeps, and they're not going to come on, on jet planes, they're going to bring them up in, the, in a certain, uh, their, in their car, in their trucks, or whatever case be, to come up to Israel. The temple's got to be built. Yes, all the stones is there, but throw it up, you don't do that in two weeks. They may take a year before they get the whole temple ground and everything settled in its place. So it is plausible that from the miracle war, to the Zika War, there could be a space of three years or so. That's enough time for the Holy Ghost to move in a mighty manner to bring this bride to completion. In my heart, I can't see it come together before that miracle time happens. Because men are set in their ways, what they believe. Not even dynamite can move them out of their position. But when God starts confirming with signs and wonders, not everybody is going to be right. We can all be wrong. Well, if we're all wrong, then there'll be no bride, right? And so therefore, I believe the Lord will be confirming what's been truth. And what I want along to see, and I wish it would happen before, is the nine spiritual gifts we need that just as much as you need the word because it'll probably be with, the, with the, those gifts during that time of the miraculous 
that God's going to bring this down to a showdown and clean the church to get her in her final position because the next thing in order after Ezekiel 38 and 39, the seventh seal is going to be broke. And if we've been watching, then knowing the understanding of the time and the season, how that the centuries stopped, how that there would be three watches, how there would be a, the judgment seat of Christ in that half hour of silence. All these things are just as important to the bride as knowing about the miracle war. The miracle war, the building of the temple, and the Ezekiel war, that has to do with your Jews, which is a parallel for us. And if you're just watching for the war itself, then we have to watch. And Jesus said, watch and pray. For the hour, you don't know the hour that he's coming. So he's been giving more information as we're getting closer. Well, we don't need to know that. We'll just fall right into it. My foot. If he said, pray and watch. He's putting emphasis on this time frame leading to coming to that opening of that seventh seal. I don't know about you, but I, I rejoice inside for the things that God has opened up. Okay, maybe you just want me to preach John 3.16 for the next following year. Is that, will that be okay with you? Will everybody be at peace? We love one another. Uh, we gotta live right. That's important. Don't neglect that. And how, and there too, do we check ourselves or if we've been drifting in how we should conduct ourselves and how we should dress when we, not just coming here before the Lord, but as in our daily lives? That's important too. God looks upon it. No, it won't. He, he can correct us. It's not going to take away your salvation. If you're a child of God, you're a child of God. Right? I don't know. Maybe next week I'll come in with just a T-shirt. How about that? You think the Lord would be, would be happy with that? Uh, maybe in a pair of shorts and sneakers would, wouldn't, be, wouldn't hurt because it's warm, you know. My foot. Remember, we're coming before the king. Royalty. When we assemble here, no, you don't see him, but he's looking upon us. Now, if the, if the queen of England was here to talk to you and I, a lot of people would just dress right. And when I see the queen, when it, she does come from time to time, Somehow, some of the women put on dresses. Why? Other times, they're all in pantsuit. Now, I'm going down the road. I shouldn't be going down for it. You better afraid you're going to make us feel bad. Good. I'd have to say, you're thank you should be thankful you're not living in the days of Brother Branham. Your ears would burn. <laughs> no. He preached on dress, he preached on shorts, he preached on bob hair, he preached on a whole lot of things. Now that's the women's side, but on the men's side just as well, just as bad. You're not going to go down, well, do you like my fluffy shirt? Somewheres we must not neglect how we represent ourselves in this world. Now, we can put down a, 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 like a hammer and put down the rule like they've done in Pentecost. If there's something that's needful, let's say if, if you're going to be working somewhere and if you're working, let's say, uh, not that, you're, that women works on the roof or things like that, but you wouldn't want to work with the dress on the roof because men will be able to see in the wrong places, right? So you'd want something to cover yourself. First of all, women should be on the roof anyway. Well, you say, well... Uh, maybe I'm getting deeper here. But it's just 
how we present ourselves. God gave us a brain to give us, use some common sense. And with that, brothers and sisters, the hour's over. I'm finished for the night, and I've got a busy week. I'll probably need a vacation after next week, if you know what I mean. But I'll enjoy it just the same. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It'll be different. Let's just stand at this time. And Brother Bob Killam, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer this evening? Amen. Amen. God bless each one.